Hi, this is Kelly with Gia's Italian Kitchen. I am here with a very, very special guest today, Joe Gatto, and he is tuning in from Boston. Um, he is a radio and TV personality. You're an author. Um, you have crazy, funny stuff on social media. So if you haven't heard of him, um, we're going to get to know him today and post all of his contact information in the notes so that you can get to know him even better. Joe, thank you so much for being here today. This is so exciting. I'm excited. Thanks for having me, Kelly. This is great. Okay, well, let's dive in. So you have been out there for years and years and years, but how did this really get started? Was this you cooking in the kitchen with your grandmother or or where did this start? Oh, yeah, this this goes back to the, the kitchen with my mom, you know, and being on the counter and, you know, starting off doing the sifting, the chopping and things like that. And then progressing as I got older into bigger tasks. And it was just always something in the kitchen for me and my mom, you know, that was beyond the dish. It was about sharing time, you know, and they call the kitchen the heart of the house for a reason. Yeah. And that's really where our relationship, you know, solidified. It was one of those things that, and for me, you know, food is so beyond just what you're putting in your mouth. You can make a great meal, but it's always about that experience, right? Mm -hmm. And that yeah. you're sharing because, Food has a way to leap over language, politics, you know, anything like that. Food leaps over because when you're sharing a meal, you're sharing a part of yourself. Yeah. And that's where I really learned it in my, and we'd be, you know, on Saturdays, we'd cook all day, little 13 inch black and white TV, pumping out Julia and Jacques Pepin. And, <laughs> you know, that, and we just make dishes all day. And I got to meet Julia further in my career. So that was, that was pretty Oh my cool. gosh. Yeah. How did that come neat. about? How did you mean uh, it? It was it was just through a place that I was at, um, East Coast Grill, and she came in, and I just got to meet her and chat with her at her table, and you know she's such an icon. Just having that time, she's very tall. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was just you know one of those pinnacles for me, and that's what I derived my whole you know attitude about TV because Julia was always about inspiring mm -hmm. and you know not just showing things that people can't do i want people to cook and i mean for your audience if they don't know me or if they do like my whole background like my brand is from scratch so right. i'm ha i'm hand forging my own knives i'm pulling water out of the atlantic making salt you know i'm making my own charcoal i'm breaking down whole animals and that's what i wanted to do on my show because i think it's something that the average home cook is interested in and I wanted to make it so it was accessible. Mm -hmm. And so you you don't have to do it, but to see where everything comes from the core and then build it up from there, I thought it was an interesting journey. And, you know, lo and behold, I thought it was going to be a really little niche show, but a lot of people globbed on and really loved it. Well, it's because you're very entertaining. So you're oh, showing us you. how, to, how to cook um, or make the charcoal, but you're, you're hysterical on some of the you. episodes. So, <laughs> so it's really fun to watch. So how do you bridge the, I'm going into the ocean to make my own salt to, I mean, one of the things I think it was in your book that I saw was you're making your own hamburger bun and you're making your own ketchup and mustard. That's something that the, the average household could grasp onto and replicate. So how well, do you bridge awesome. all the crazy stuff with the things that maybe people will actually try? Well, I mean, some of the crazy stuff's just for me because I'm a little out there, okay. you know, and I really, <laughs> I love to, I love to push the boundaries. Yeah. It's just something that exploring that for me led me down a path that, you know, I met so many artisans and so many people over my career that have just blown me away because I've figured out food is the perfect science blend between science and art. Mm -hmm. And all these people were experts in their field. And I learned so much and I build relationships that have lasted forever through that because of that bond of food. So when I was designing my book, yeah, I want to put in, you know, how to do a whole hog roast. No, that <laughs> not everyone's going to do. And, you know, making your own bacon, like a slab of bacon, it, it's really not that hard if you have a smoker. Yeah. And but I wanted to show people and say, hey, you know, you don't have to make the bacon. I get it. Right. Like, yeah, I get it. But it's not hard making bread. Right. Right, right. You know, and if you want to experiment, make your own mustard. Maybe you'll love it. Maybe you won't. 
but yeah. maybe I'll make the pickles too. Right. And then next thing you know, you're, you're always making pickles. I call like that from like making pickles and things like that. It's like the gateway drug to from scratch. You know, it's like <laughs> the first one's free. And next thing you know, you're like, wow, those pickles are really good. I'm going to grind my own beef. Mm. Right. Or you ask the butcher instead of just taking what's under plastic wrap and saying, OK, you make up your own blend with a little brisket and chuck and it comes out awesome. You have friends over. And you're like, yeah, he ground it for me, but this is my blend. And then you're like, you know what? I'm going to grind it. And then it starts opening up all these doors because I have three kids, right? 13, 10, and five. They're cooking all the time. We just, me and my kid, my two girls just made cake pops just before I got on here, right? Oh, and that's so cute. We made mac and cheese this morning and pizzas. And I did a pizza class last night for 150 in the middle of Boston on a roof deck. So, oh my gosh, wow. It, it was awesome. My my oh, whole team was with me and it was just amazing. It's one of the one of my partners, the Sudbury in Boston. It's incredible. All overlooking the North End in Boston, just making all these pizzas. I was teaching people how to I did a demo on how to pull uh fresh mozzarella. Yeah. And how to make a 72-hour dough and why those things are important. Grinding your own flour at home. Things that people at first might say, "Oh, come on." Who's going to grind their own flour? That's stupid. <laughs> right? And then all of a sudden they taste the bread. Right. Like, whoa. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe, maybe I would try something like that. It opens it up and people know me now. So when I first started it, you know, it, I got a lot of side eyes. You know, like people are like, you're going to, you're going to do what? Like, you're going to make charcoal. Why would you do that? And for me, it's because how does it work? Yeah. Like, you know, I asked people, and that was one of the things when we were researching the show, I asked people how charcoal is made. And everyone's like, I have no idea. <laughs> and I'm like, would you, would you be interested to know how it's made? And they're like, yeah, how do you make that? And once I have that knowledge that people are like, yeah, I don't understand that. Even things like making pasta dough, which I've mm -hmm. taught thousands of times. Yeah. Making pasta dough is one of the easiest things in yeah. the world. Yeah. And when you when you crack open that door, all of a sudden they're making it with their family. And now I feel happy because I'm doing what Julia did and it's inspiring people to share time. And that's so what I'm you, really after. So would you say that Julia was one of your earlier mentors or who who's on that list of your early mentors? Julia is uh, she's the top of the mountain. That's she is. um I think she's the most inspirational person that's ever been on television. I have other chefs that I love to watch, like uh, Rick Bayless is a huge one for me because I'm a big, I love Mexican food. I have a place in Tulum in Mexico. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. And so we're down there a lot. And that kind of food is, that's my magic because I grew up in Boston, right? That is so cool. So you're meeting with him later today. And what do you No, guys no, I'm meeting with my podcast guys today oh. oh okay yeah i'm meeting with my uh podcast in la so we my new, new podcast, podcast will be up in a yeah that's going to be up in like two weeks so uh baking bad is the podcast which uh everything you, you can find everything about me through my instagram at chef yeah. jogato it all funnels there so if anyone's interested to see the tv show the my radio show on npr get my book, see my podcast, or soon to see my podcast because it's going to stream and be on it, all the podcast um, platforms. That would be it. It's pretty, it's going to be a pretty fun podcast. We've had some fun guests on, so I'll be dropping those as little nuggets as we go. Okay. That is excellent. And you've got phenomenal pictures on your Instagram. I love, I saw a ratatouille that was like everything yeah. standing up. That was beautiful. And, um, what were a couple of the other ones? Oh, like it was like a yin yang um, pasta with the black and the white plate. Yeah, I um, I I made that plate from scratch. I I actually made that. Okay, that was. And good. then um, yeah, I do all my own photography because I was a photographer and filmmaker before. Yeah, that's, so that's helpful. Yeah, yeah, it's a uh, it, everything comes into play: writing, directing. You know, I'm writing two more TV shows right now. Um. 
that we start pitching really soon to the networks. And one of them I wrote was is called Feast Mode. And then I'm, I wrote um, like a real television show, like a comedy called Mini Balls, which is about professional miniature golfers. <laughs> and um, and we're going to we're going with that too. The company that I I know, production company up in L.A. in uh in the Toronto, they have offices. Love the pilot, so we're gonna take that out too. So it's my schedule is crazy, you know, but I love it. A TV. How did you get that going? My TV show. Yeah, like your very first concept. You got it booked. You're online. Like, how did that happen? Um. Well, the TV show is an interesting. This is interesting because I met my lovely wife. She came on as a producer on a feature film I was directing back in the day. Okay. And she came on that she has her degree in film and a master's in psychology. And she came on through recommendation through my cinematographer of a feature I was, I was making. So when we met, um, we just really hit it off. So as when we had my son, when she got pregnant with my son, both of us decided to switch careers because we didn't want to raise him in Los Angeles in the film industry. Mm-hmm. It's just, I love that industry and so did my wife, but not for a family. So I was at Sony Pictures at the time and we moved back here and I started my culinary journey. And it started off just teaching, which took off for me. And then a woman came in and it ended up she owned a private chef business and she asked me to come to work for her because she thought my food was phenomenal and and then a year after I was working for her I bought the business from her because I I was like oh I get it and I went and made it A-listers and then I got a Red Sox player and then I got a Celtics player (laughs) and like it just kept growing and then in the middle of like this business growing and people starting to call me chef. It was really weird, right? I'm like getting in magazines. And my wife said to me, you know, with your personality, you should do a TV show. And that's the producer in her, right? And I was like, yeah, I was like, that's a good idea. I just don't know what I do. And she's taught, we used to watch Emerald all the time, Emerald Live. Oh, yeah. And remember, like, bam, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, and so I, I chewed it over, pun intended, for like, um, like a week. And I was like, you know, if I do everything from scratch, that's kind of an interesting take. Mm-hmm. So, I'll, I'll, you know, why don't I write a pilot? So I wrote a, it, I think I wrote a pilot in like four days. And then I called a couple of my friends who are, you know, professional filmmakers. And I was like, hey, you know, you want to come down, help me out. I got a kitchen for the day. I'm going to do a pilot to a show. So we went and shot it. Uh, We shot it over two days and then, you know, cut it, you know, because I have all those. I know how to edit. I know how to do all of it. And I cut it. And right at the same time, my wife had asked me to do her a favor and teach a pasta class to her best clients that she had in real estate. So it was lawyers and things like that. So I did. And that night after the class, we're all sitting around and one of them says to me, oh, would you ever want to open up a restaurant? I was like, oh, God, no, I don't want to work. You know, like, (laughs) right. Like, Like that's, you know, that for me is like, I'm not built for that. And I was like, no, I like the private chef life. And they were like, oh, well, we're angel investors. And we were looking for something to do. And they were like, you're so entertaining. The food is some of the best I've ever had in my life. You know, we thought that would be like a natural. And I was like, no, I was like, but interesting enough, I did just shoot a pilot to a TV show. And they're like, oh, can you send it to us? So I did cut to three months later and they gave me all the money for an entire season. Oh my gosh. So I wrote a whole season and we spent four months filming it all through New England and then cut it. Then I had this whole TV show. I sent it to a friend of mine who'd been asking about it, Tony Crow, who does sound. He works with like all bands like the Foo Fighters and things like that. And he had really wanted to see it. So I sent him the the new pilot and he called me back after I sent it to him. It was about a half hour after I sent it to him. He literally watched it and called me. He's like, it's like, dude, this is one of the best shows I've ever seen. And he's like, I don't, he's like, I don't know what you're doing. He's like, but this thing's unbelievable. 
He's like, can I send it to one of my friends at a, a distribution house? And you need distribution before you do any, like even think about networks, right? No one knows this part of the TV, that TV takes forever, right? It's, it's a whole, there's a lot of money at stake. So there's a lot of people that you have to go through. It's sure. not, there's no such thing as like overnight success. That's one in eight bajillion. Yeah. And so what I didn't know was it went through a chain there that this woman had gotten it that Tony sent it to and she gave it to her boss and he loved it. And then it went up to the VP who's Danny Bellardi, who's now a great friend of mine and he loved it. And they called me and they acquired it. Wow. And then they got it in Pluto's hands and Pluto said, yeah, we love it. We're going to put it on. And next thing I know, we were on TV and, you know, it's like 10 million viewers. We were number one in the food slot for like eight months. Wow. And it just gained this hu huge audience. And now it's created all these opportunities where I started doing a, like uh, developing a show with Brian Callen from The Hangover. And that led me to a production team where we're doing this other show called Feast Mode that I came up with. And I just keep developing more ideas that we're getting onto the air. So it, it's the journey is strange, but it's like everything in my life. It's, it's just this always weird windy path. And I'm really malleable and I'm very easygoing, but I'm an extremely hard worker. So I'm a big believer that you create your own opportunities. And the, if you quit when things get hard, well, that's on you. You know, thing, failure is part of it. And you need failure to succeed because not only is it good for you, but it helps you develop your ideas. Because if someone says no, maybe you didn't present it correctly. Maybe you haven't thought your idea up properly. Maybe you haven't worked hard enough. There's a lot of things that you can turn and look at yourself and turn into a positive because I love what I do and I work really hard at it, but I also have the ability to take a breath and watch it develop you don't and not constantly punch it. You. Right. You need to like you in a different direction than you intended. But if you, yeah, if you're working hard and you just keep, keep at it and and follow up and you're persistent right and have a clear path of what yeah. what you're trying to do because it will change yeah. you know life the minute you have a plan you know life starts giggling at you yeah because that's not how it works and all i know is all i can control what i do and i can control that that i'm genuine that i love my family that i give back as much as i can and that I do things my way and I don't try to copy people. And if people don't get what I'm doing, that's fine. Because I, I can tell you when we were developing from scratch, there was a lot of people, a lot of people told me that it would never work. And so that there's, crazy. No, there's no way you can do things from scratch in a half hour TV show and make it interesting. And I was fine with that because they don't see it like I do. Mm -hmm. And I know that I can make film. I know that I can cook and I know I love being on camera. If I'm good or not, that's up to what people think, but I love doing it. So creating a show that wraps around my family, making things from scratch, I'm sure, you know, they probably had a point. They're probably like Gatto's an idiot, you know, like what was he thinking? There's why would he throw so why would he like throw it, people's right? money away? Not everyone loves everything. So you, you can't please everyone. I don't make things for everyone to like. Yeah. And I never have and I never will. And yeah. I I like I like doing things my way because it keeps it pure and yeah. it makes it if people do get it, they fall in love with it. Mm -hmm. And that's that's important to me. Thank <laughs> you. I really appreciate that. So what came first, the the book or the TV? Um the book came out just before we started filming. Okay. Okay. So how yeah, the, did you get the book to, going and published? The book, what was that process like? Well, the book was interesting because I had I had no intention of writing a book. Oh. And it was never something I was like, oh, I'm going to write a book too. 
but my friend one of my friends uh good friends is andy husbands and he's a big chef he owns the smoke shops out here which is barbecue chain and he's been on food network he's he's a beast just an absolute beast and him and i have been friends forever and he actually yeah it was a phone call he called me and we were talking and he was like you need to do a book Hmm. and i was like a book like and he has like 10 books you know oh, like, wow. and and at like a billion restaurants he's like entrepreneur mr entrepreneur okay and i'm like a book oh i don't know and next thing you know he has me in touch with his publisher oh my gosh and <laughs> i'm on the phone with his publisher and the publisher is like well tell me your story so i start talking to them and at the end of the phone call they're like yeah, yeah, we want to we want to do a book with you. We want to sign you now. Oh, and that's amazing. They, they signed me, and uh, I think I wrote the book in six months. Wow. I just sat down, wrote it, and then recipe tested it and sent it to, oh, I don't know, like 60 people and, like, test this recipe, do this blind, and then we got someone to come on that tested all the recipes, too, and double-checked everything. Okay. The book process takes wow. that, um, that's, well, it's like anything. Yeah. It, it's very consuming. Yeah, yeah. It's very consuming. I like writing television more than I like writing books, but uh, it was, it was a super fun experience. Mm -hmm. And people that do more than one, God bless them. I did because start it, writing it, one, but I obviously I don't have a publisher, but um, I'm writing it and I'm trying to navigate, you know, the research of, you know, the the self-publishing and the traditional the other stuff. And I'm really an unknown. So, you know, I, I'm not going to get picked up, but it's been very fun learning about the process and just yeah. write when I have free time, just because I'm, I'm doing a cookbook, but it's a memoir. Um, That's so, great. You know, we'll it's see where it goes. It's a great way to understand yourself a little better, mm -hmm. which is always the goal, right? Always trying to get yourself a little better, understand what, why you're acting the way you act. You know, that's, that's, <laughs> that's what it, that, that time of self-reflection, yeah. right? That's a good point. It, it is good. And you start to learn, like for me, it was a great uh, time to research food. Yeah. Yeah. And really dig in and be like, oh, I love this. And, you know, I love shoving tacos in my pie hole. I want to do a couple <laughs> of those, you know, I, like, let's do a fish taco. I love doing those. And that, it, that was a really fun thing to do. Okay. So let's talk about Italy. You're Italian. Yes or yes? I'm, I'm like every kid in Boston. I'm half Italian, half Irish. Oh my God. That's exactly what I am. Okay. See? I know, but I'm not from Boston, I'm from Chicago, but half Italian, uh, half Irish. <laughs> um, where, where's your family from in Italy? Oh, I don't know. Haven't you been to your family village? No. What? No. My, we didn't have history in my family. The only thing my dad knew about, like, my Italian heritage was that he could say fungu. That was, like, the only thing he could do. He didn't speak Italian. Like, we, we had, he had no history. Well, my mom didn't speak Italian either, but I think that's because they were raised in the post-World War II era where yeah. all of our families were trying to Americanize. And so my right. grandma didn't teach my my mom and her kid, you know, her siblings the language, but they taught the tradition and the food, right? But not the language. But Yeah, see, we didn't have that in my family either, because my dad, my dad, my dad couldn't, you know, he could burn water. He was a horrible cook. So yeah, yeah, he didn't he didn't carry over any of those traditions. So did you met your grandma though, right? You cooked with your your grandma. Oh no, I mean, she I mean, she wasn't that big a cook. Oh my it, god. Did, we did just didn't really have that had we just didn't have that heritage like you know, she, she just didn't cook a lot. She lived in a little apartment. Yeah. You know, and she just didn't cook a lot and he my like I said my dad couldn't cook at all. It was always my mom. And your mom was the Irish? Yeah. So And okay. I still cook with my mom all the time. So a lot of your recipes are self-taught then. They're not yeah. handed down. No, like some of the stuff like, you know, like I, I mean my grandmother made pasta, like I and I knew how that mm -hmm. she did that, but it's not like she did Sunday dinners. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. you know so like I learned something like that from her okay but it's not like that was hey we're going to grandma's on Sunday and doing that yeah I mean the tradition of my family there, there wasn't any and it which is which was pretty common for where I grew up in Arlington which is just blue collar it okay. didn't it just didn't have and you know my mom didn't come over from Ireland you know her parents didn't come over with any kind of traditions or anything like that so we were just like American suburbia okay I mean I would expect that from the Irish side that's surprising from the Italian side yeah yeah and my grandfather I didn't know him I didn't know either of my grandfathers so yeah maybe he would have carried it down maybe he made sausage I don't know I never got much information on that <laughs> but I do like making sausage so maybe it's just in the blood wow that is crazy so we did do the, the the Sunday dinners and the family barbecues and, you know, all the grandpas were sitting in the backyard with their lawn chairs and doing the glass of wine, all the stuff. Yeah. So awesome. That's, that's how I came, came to, you know, to love, love the food and the cooking and wanting to do my, my business. But it's because um, I really did grow up in the kitchen. Do you so still do that now? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I've been doing this for about, well, I started it in 2019 and I actually started as a personal chef and I actually didn't like that. Um, it was just very, um, very demanding and, you know, people, I don't like beef. I don't like pork. I'm a vegetarian. And I was like, oh, that's, <laughs> that's, a lot, <laughs> that's a lot to, to shuffle. Um, so what I do is uh, cooking instruction. So like you did the other night, you did the pasta class or the pizza. Yeah. So I do virtual dinner parties or online or in-person dinner parties and then team building events for employers um, as nice. part of employee culture program. So online or virtual. Um, and then I do community events, you know, where I'm doing free classes for whatever. Sure. Um, That's great. But yeah, it's all, it's all around bringing the people from my perspective, bringing the people together to emulate that Sunday dinner because a lot of people today don't do that anymore. And that's a fond memory of mine from growing up is, is coming yeah. together with your friends and family. Yeah. I mean, we definitely like my mom and I, like we love doing dinner and stuff like that and like having dinner at the house. That's definitely something that I caught the bug from and still do, you know, we still love to make dinner together. I think it's important because you can order a pizza out and it'll be yummy. I'm sure. But if you make a pizza together, you're making a memory. Mm -hmm. You know, you're building something different. You're and you're getting stories that you typically w wouldn't get. You know, it's just there's a lot more sharing when your hands are busy. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and it does. It creates the memories of the people with you, and they tend to to enjoy the food better if they've taken part in making it. Thousand percent. Thousand percent. Um. Okay. So all of this is like you have such momentum and. And all of these things that you're juggling, what's an obstacle for you right now? What's a challenge for you right now? I mean, I always see an obstacle as being, you know, you're always your worst enemy, right? You, I mean, I, I just don't, I never view things as obstacles. I'm just, I've never been that way. I've always been, you know, if something's hard, that's the way it is, mm -hmm. you know, and you can either lie down or jump over it or kick it out of the way. You know, obstacles, I just think they're in your minds because there's going, it, every journey, if it's worthwhile, is going to be hard. It's going to have its challenges. Is writing every day hard? Yeah. I mean, people have this, you know, there's a romantic view of, you know, just the writer and his cup of coffee and everything. But, you know, writing is a grind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, and I think, I, I don't feel like there's obstacles. There's definitely things that are difficult. But, you know, last night I was just, I was demoing for, you know, a hundred people pulling fresh mops, laughing all night. My team's making tons of pizzas and we're under the stars in the middle of Boston. Like, and then today I'm writing and then I'm on this awesome podcast and then I'm going to meet for my podcast. Like I enjoy my life a lot and it's purposeful because there's a lot to enjoy. I have three wonderful kids. I have a great marriage. You know, I I try to look at if something's hard. Well, it's there's the hard parts for everyone, for everything. So you either attack it or give up. And I'm not 
I'm a pit bull. Yeah. You know, I, I hang on and, and I, part of it is it proves a lot to yourself of who you are because anyone can do anything when it's easy. Yeah. It's really, you know, when it's right there and everybody's handing it to you, sure, I can do that. Who can't? But yeah. when it's get when it gets hard, that's when you figure out who you are and what you're really about. Because that's that's the time that the people that succeed succeed. Mm -hmm. The people that stay where they are stay where they are because they're like, well, that's too much work or that's too many no's or I can't take that anymore. And I'm not I'm just never that guy. Yeah. I'm always I'm very glass half full, drink it and pour me another glass of water because <laughs> Oh, I, fun. <laughs> <laughs> I I like the challenge. I like when things get a little hard. I it doesn't it doesn't intimidate me to start with a blank slate and say, you know, okay, I, like make a TV show. Like what? That seems overwhelming, but people do it, and I did it. Yeah. You know, and then it leads to more. Or like like you're experiencing, right? Like writing a book. If you write it, it will get done. Yeah. If you have an opportunity to write and you're like, yeah, I don't feel like doing that. That's the key because what you have to do in writing is when you don't feel like writing, you might have to sit there and just force yourself. And if you write one word or you end up with a blank page after two hours, that counts as writing. <laughs> or if you scratch <laughs> it once out and then redo it. <laughs> it doesn't matter because what yeah. it is, is it's firing your creativity. Yeah. Right. And so that gets your juices flowing. So you might not get the idea. That's the winner idea right there. But your mind is constantly thinking about it. I always find my best ideas are when like I'm just about to fall asleep. And I just have my phone next to me and I'm always waking up, writing it down. That's why I probably sleep like four hours a day. Yeah. 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 There's something about it that it, it's always firing. But yeah, I mean, obstacles are going to there. I would say that there's always obstacles yep. every day in anything that's worthwhile. And like I teach my kids, it's up to you. It's up to you how you deal with that obstacle. Anyone can, everyone's going to get an obstacle, but you have to make the decision how you deal with it. Yeah. And once you figure that out, then you'll be okay because you're either going to quit or you're going to have to tackle it. And if it's hard, well, deal with it because yeah. things are hard no one hands anything to you right yeah mostly people want to take stuff yeah and i i like that kind of thing like i like swinging for the fences i like having to work hard i like working 24 7 like just creating my brand out of nothing and creating a niche in life that's mine like my career is so unique yeah no one has my career and it's because I, that's what I wanted. Right, right. And, you know, so that's always my advice to people when I do talks and things like that. You know, like, how did you create your career? Well, you, you have to think about what you really want to do. Yeah. Because you, it can be done. It's just how much do you want to do? How much effort do you want to put in? How many no's are you willing to hear? Because right. when I first started, sure, now I know everyone, right? Like now... I get on TV, I get in magazines and things like that. But the first five years, it didn't work like that. Yeah. You know, it was... I'm, I'm very much similar where I, I've, I've never called myself a pit bull, but um, I'm persistent, I'm resilient, and I I, I don't like no's, but I keep going forward. And I, I'm trying to pivot and, and, and continue to improve and reach more people and impact more people. Um, so aside from that, what advice would you have for me as, you know, this is pretty early on for me. I'm really only like two to three years into this portion of the business. Um, so aside from like, keep going, be resilient, be persistent. What advice do you have for me or other, you know, small business owners that are trying to get going? Be yourself, be you. Do what works for you. Do what you think is cool. Do what you think is good. Don't try to cop to trends. Don't try to be like someone else. If you're you, people haven't seen that. If you're copying someone that's already successful, 
people have seen that and you're not a good as version. Yeah. So like when you're writing or you're being on screen or whatever you're choosing to do, you're making pottery, like your personality is what sets it apart. And that's where a lot of fear base comes in for people. Yeah. I haven't talked to people for years and years and years about this, doing like public speaking for things like that. You know, it's, it's fear based that if you expose yourself, that's when you're most vulnerable, right? Yeah, yeah. But when you expose yourself, that's also you. And there will be people that take it. And there will be people that say, oh, I love that. Then that will give you true confidence, not fake confidence, real confidence. And you have to keep moving forward. Like the naysayers, the trolls, all that, they're going to be there forever. But you don't, it's, how do they affect, that's one of the things I always tell people as well. They don't truly affect you. They can't take thing. They can't take you away. So be yourself when you're doing your podcast. If you think there's like crazy questions you should ask, or you know you want to do a hipper opening, or you want to try some class that you know Venezuelan, which you haven't done before. These are good things. When you get outside of your comfort zone, is when you start to truly create and you start to truly figure out who you are as an artist. When you stay in the box. You'll never be who you were supposed to be because there's you have to get out of that comfort zone to really find what you're striving to truly do. You have to keep expanding and keep changing and being malleable, staying straight and narrow. I mean, you, you get I mean, you can do that. Like, you know, if you're working like a nine to five and that's how you work and you want to just keep that line, that's great. But we're talking about like being an artist. Yeah. Being, you know, that that's a whole different ballgame because being an artist, there's a lot of artists out there, but you really have to take chances if you want to find out how far you want to go and like just how far your talent goes. And, you know, you'll never know by doing the same class over and over again or having the same system over and over again, changing and constantly doing new things. It puts a fire in your belly like we, you know, doing the class last night, we hadn't, I hadn't done a class version. I've done demos in front of thousands, but I hadn't done like a class demo thing. Like we were like, this is a whole new format for us, but that's what, you know, our client was interested in doing. So we did this crazy like class demo hybrid and it was like a party class live demo music. And like, it was one of the best times we ever had. It was amazing. So if I had taken that and said, yeah, we don't really do that. We'd rather just do the 30 person class like we always do. Okay, yeah, I'm sure the class would have went well, but this brought a whole new part of business that we didn't know existed. And it was full of so much energy. People have been writing me all day. And that's awesome because we touch people. And one of the, I got an email from there's a kid, a family that lives there, and this kid is about seven. And he does a little newsletter to his family and all his friends from Poland. Oh, wow. And once a month, he does this newsletter that he sends to, you know, his parents help him and he puts in clips. It's adorable. So this month, it was about because he I've known him for about a year and a half because he comes to all my classes. He loves to cook. Aww. So he comes with his parents. And this month's uh, newsletter was me. So they sent me the newsletter Aww. and it was pictures of me and him, right? Like I can feel myself but like, and that was last night, right? Like, so it's touching people. It's, yeah. it's doing something that's, it's not just eating pizza. It, and it's, it's part, it's like my life and my work are so intertwined Yeah, that it makes what I do Daily, really like deep and rich and that's what I'm always looking for like a, a deep and rich experience and when I was able to incorporate my my brand and my business into that I found what I wanted to do and now I'm constantly looking to expand it and to to bridge it and to see what else is out there to do with the brand because I'm always trying to change it and find new things and dig deeper and that's what that would be my big, huge recommendation to people is like, don't be afraid to be you because that's what's the most unique yeah. is you. 
right? Uh, the brand and everything else and how you market it and Instagram and how many views you get and, you know, like what platforms you're on, that's all ancillary yeah. to who you are. That's the only thing that's truly unique about your business is you. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome advice. I love it. I'm taking yeah. it. I'm taking it. Okay, so I know that, that you have a hard stop, but before we cut um, cut the podcast, what is something that you would like your listening audience to know about, either about you or about what's going on in your world today that we haven't talked about yet today? Oh, wow. Um well, if, one thing, definitely stop by my Instagram at, at Chef Joe Gatto because you can see lots of stuff. Yeah. Um, I guess, you know, there's so many fun things, but I guess the best thing I would say is uh, is like one thing about me that I'm super proud about is um, how my kids eat off the carts in Mexico when we're down there, that they're not afraid. They don't need chicken nuggets. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. That's something I take a lot of pride in. Um, but I have, you know, if it's stuff for, like listening to my NPR show, if you don't know, I have an NPR show, definitely check it out. But I have a, my new podcast starts in a couple of weeks called uh, Baking Bad. And we have a lot of celebrity guests coming on and we're going to have them in the kitchen with my two co-hosts who absolutely can't cook. So it's just let the hilarity oh, ensue while they try to. I kind of, I'm there in LA and I'm here in Boston. So I kind of watch over them like God and just make fun of them as they're trying to, uh, to attempt to cook something in the kitchen with our celebrity guest. Oh, that'll be fun. So it's, it's really entertaining and you can link to that through my Instagram and, uh, episodes dropping that in a couple of weeks. One of our first guests is Andrus Langston, who is the creator of the baking steel, which is if you make pizzas and you're in the pizza making world. It is the home cook's best way to make pizza. It's a huge business. He's in the New York Times. He's an amazing guy. So if you want to learn how to make real pizza at home, like 72-hour dough, the whole deal, yeah, definitely tune in to that one because that's going to be a good one. Other than that, I loved being here. and You're awesome. This has been so amazing. Thank you so much for being here. Joe Gatto with uh, all sorts of stuff. He's mentioned all of his his book, his TV, his radio. Uh, check him out. We'll post all of his links in, in the uh, notes. And hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thanks so much for joining us. It's Kelly Absolutely. with Kelly Kitchen and Joe Gatto. Have me back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>